All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session, Scopey Change Management in Drupal 8. Um, we're just working out some change management on the fact that uh, Google likes to just, you know, re-engineer their UX for all of their tools um, at the best possible time. So. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, the presenter mode launched a couple nights ago. Like, I was working on our presentation. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I noticed presenter mode. So um, we actually can't get it to work. So we're going to completely wing it <laughs> without speaker notes. So forgive us if we go far astray. <laughs> Um, so we're super excited to be here in New Orleans. Is everyone having a great time so far? First day of DrupalCon. <laughs> Woo! All right. Um, so we'll just kick off with introductions. Uh, my name is Molly Burns. Um, I'm an account director with Phase 2. Um, I've been around the Drupal space uh, since Drupal 4.7. Um, and I was uh, one of the early content managers for one of the largest uh, early corporate Drupal platforms in Drupal 5 and Drupal 6. Um, so I've sort of seen all of those dark days and edge cases around checkboxes. I remember when the blocks page, um, you managed it with moving, changing negative numbers and negative integers, and uh, that was the administrative experience. Um, and uh, fast forward to now, and uh, I'm working on a Drupal 8 platform, and I did a Drupal 8 site last year, so it's just amazing to see um, the software and this community evolved uh, over the years, and super excited to be here uh, talking with you all. And a uh, fun fact about me is that I'm a crystal collector, I'm an avid rock hound, actually have one with me right now, um, so. <laughs> um, I'm Ellie Power. I am a um, developer and a serial entrepreneur, and I'm excited to be part of phase two running the uh, project management office. Um, I have been working with PHP since PHP 3. I built a, um, a digital asset auction program when we couldn't license from eBay and a CMS back in, I don't know, 1998, 2000. So I'm probably older than most of you. I'm com a complete dinosaur. <laughs> um, and I also have a lot of experience with object-oriented programming, so I'm really excited to see how that'll play out in Drupal 8. OK, so just briefly about phase two. Uh, I hope that many of you have heard of us. We um, conduct digital transformations for clients from digital strategy through uh, web apps and websites. Um, we probably have about 40 um, projects running at any one time, so we have tons of experience in managing scope and change, and we hope to share that with you today. So um, we want to start off and talk a little bit about um, some zero, zero G moments. So I don't know if anyone's ever been on a project and um, your, your stomach drops, so something comes out of nowhere and <laughs> everyone's making a fuss and um, that, that's, that's the mode where we operate in. Um, so we sort of wanted to uh, kick, kick this off um, and share some, some, per some personal zero G moments. Um, uh, so well, the story that I'm going to tell is my, for my first uh, project at Phase 2, uh, first project that I was launching at Phase 2, I was working on um, a university site. We were upgrading from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. And I don't know if anyone's uh, ever uh, worked with a university or been a part of university, but, you know, university IT, um, a lot of times it's you know, legacy systems, they're hosting a lot of authenticated users in-house, very complicated, there's a lot of characters, people that have been there for 20, 30 years that are running these servers. Um, so it's definitely a new world and a deep world that I, I learned a lot about. Um, and we were doing this project and we were, we were trying to get the servers ready and they needed to be requisitioned internally in the university and there was a whole lot of complicated steps to that. And we were at our final week when we were supposed to get the servers and I get an email that says, that the sysadmin was stung by 20 bees the day before. And I was, first of all, like, is he okay? Okay, what's going on? But secondly, just sort of like, okay, now, now we're definitely going to be delayed. Um, and so we had, we had to work through that, um, but I just remember being like, of anything else that could go wrong with, the, with these servers, now there's a bunch of bee stings uh, involved on the scene. <laughs> Hi, is that better? Okay. Um, I had built this personal fitness goal tracking app for uh, a startup. And literally at the 11.59.59th hour, 
the product owner, the owner of the company, decided that she wanted to pivot and have the entire product now be a management by objective goal setting app for the financial industry. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, she, ha she got her investors on board with this, and we reused as much as we could, but there was just so much that was just had to be scrapped. So that was probably the most extreme case of uh, scope change that I've ever experienced. Um, so um, in the name of kind of the after lunch lull, and also because this is an interactive conference, I um, wanted to just spend a couple minutes for folks to maybe share a story of one of their zero G moments with either the person next to them or a group of three, if that makes sense, um, just to sort of get us connected and also kind of grounded in this um, and also to meet some new people because that's one of the goals. Um, so uh, just take a few minutes to maybe uh, share and, you know, this is not, you don't need to name any names. Um, uh, uh therapy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we'll we'll just kind of um, tap this mic and we'll, we'll we'll restart up again once you guys have a chance to, to talk through that a little bit. Um, so yeah. Let's kind of um, five more seconds to wrap up. I'm, I'm really sad that nobody had anything to talk about. Because <laughs> I feel like our projects go wrong every single day, and I'm just so impressed that you guys really had nothing to say to each other. <laughs> okay, so let's run through what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about starting with goals. Oh, just one quick note. We obviously are going to have a sci-fi space theme to this um, presentation, so just bear with us as we build that. Um, so we're going to talk about starting with goals, methods for controlling or managing scope, um, how to deal with change, then we'll talk about specifically Drupal 8 and how some of the factors of Drupal 8 will impact how we manage scope and change. And then we're going to do a couple of scenarios to kind of tie it all together. 
So um, the first thing that I want to talk through is um, what we do when we start off any project or product build, um, which is define our goals. What, what are we doing? Are we going to the moon? Are we going to Mars? Are we building a platform? Are we building a site? Are we trying to drive donations for a nonprofit? Um, what, what is the goal that the system is accomplishing? Um, and everything we want to be doing in our projects, we want to be able to trace back to the primary goal or secondary goal. Sometimes projects have you know several goals goals and um, they are kind of you know mostly aligned but sometimes if they're in competition we we work on prioritizing goals and figuring out how we can achieve both goals or three goals um, but getting a sense of before you even commit a line of code or you know decide on your technology it's really important to figure out what you're building and why you're building it and I can't tell you how many times people are like let's just start building let's commit code we want to start immediately we want to get going we want to get going why, why is it taking so long to start and it's like Believe me, you are going to be very glad that we spent two weeks walking through your requirements, helping you define your goals, and getting refined on why we're doing what we're doing. Because when you get into the thick of the project, through some of the scenarios we're going to talk through in a bit, um, having those goals as your basis and your constraints for coordinating and collaborating and defining um, how you're going to approach different things that come up in the project is so critical. Um, Grabbing, oh, kind of cheesily grabbing the definition of scope uh, from Google. Some of the words that I really like here are opportunity and deal with. And I like deal with in terms of like, oh my god, this is another thing we have to deal with. And I also love that some of the synonyms include both gamut and confine. So there's so many contradictions when we talk about scope. But what we like to define it as is what we are working on. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm, I'm an account director, so I do I do a lot of work kind of on the the high level planning and strategy, um, working with different product owners. And um, this this process of uh, scope management, once you have your goals, the next real process for me and what I kind of do a lot of is this process of transmuting confusion um, into clarity. So every project usually starts with a scenario where someone is trying to explain to someone else something that doesn't exist yet and in that process there are a lot of like assumptions involved that come up and we're really working through um, trying to tease out what someone's understanding of one th of one requirement is versus how we're going to actually um, map that requirement to um, a, a set of tasks that can actually be achieved by a developer or a site builder um, so that's a big a big part of the scope management um, so <laughs> um, so let, let's say we're going back to our to our spaceship. We're, we're building a spaceship. We get this box. Um, we're we're expecting that we're going to open this box and we're, and we're going to get a spaceship. Um, and this is what happens actually with a lot of uh, Drupal and CMS build projects that I uh, I encounter. Um, you know, people are like, "Great, we're signed up. We're doing the Drupal. It, we assume we open the box. It's all there. We just you know spin it up. Two weeks. We we got our site right. Okay. Well." A lot of times, um, uh, you know, it's really important to, um, you know, talk through what exactly people's expectations are. And, you know, they're not necessarily going to be getting the hyperdrive spaceship when the box is opened. Um, what actually they're going to get when the box is open is a pile of Legos. Um, and these pile of Legos um, are great content modeling tools, an extensible CMS framework. There's a ton there that can be modified and, you know, configured to, to achieve business goals, but it's not going to be out of the box, that hyperdrive spaceship um, that some people might, might be expecting who haven't done a technology project before. Um, and really doing this uh, piece of education around the work it takes to put together and align all of the pieces. And you know, with Drupal 8, we've got so much in core, and it's a lot of opportunity for site builders, but there's also um, a lot of time and care and expertise that goes into how to configure the system so it's really going to be um, the best possible system for for the end users and for the product owners. Um, so it's kind of, um, in, in my experience, having the conversation early on about what is, what is in the contents of the box when you get it um, with Drupal is really, really important to start the conversation with that, that 
confusion into clarity, that's one of the big ones that um, I always really start with um, up front in the projects, just like, okay, this is what's in our box. Okay, so, okay. Um, and I guess that's one thing to take advantage of being here at DrupalCon is to learn what's in the box and what's not in the box, because that's an important piece of communication to have with your product owners. Okay, so we talked about starting with goals. I'm gonna walk you through some other techniques that we use to manage scope. Um, so first, we're gonna define our features. And I want you to just listen, right? Like, particularly if you come from a technical background or you've been working in technology as a project manager for a long time, like, you can jump ahead to, oh, here's how we could do this, or here's how we could do that. Stop, like, quiet your solution mind and just listen. A lot of times when you're thinking about how to do something, you might miss something really important. So first, we're just gonna listen. I'm not talking waterfall here. We're just gonna listen. So someone's gonna say, I want the wings of this ship. I want the hyperdrive of that other ship. I want the invisibility cloaking device of the other ship. We're just gonna listen and write it down somewhere because don't think that we can get it all. Um, and then I want a Quidditch pitch on the landing deck. Okay, so now that we've written them all down, now we can talk about what our technical approach would be. And again, this is not waterfall. It's not that we're gonna write everything down and go away for two years and come back with a web app. It could happen in the course of a single conversation, but it's important to do those things serially. Once we figure out our technical approach, we have some idea of the cost. The cost could be time, it could be money, or it could be effort. But once we get our heads around how to make those features become software, we have some idea of what those trade-offs are gonna be, and that's when we can define scope. So we have goals, we have features, we have technical approach, we throw them together in this matrix that measures value and cost, and then we have an idea of what kind of, what, what's really important, right? So things that are off the chart, it is highly unlikely that we're gonna do those. The infinite and probability drive? No, right? Like, it's too expensive. Is it really that valuable that it's off the chart valuable? In which case, we need more effort or money or whatever. Otherwise, you can get into conversations about other alternatives, right? Maybe we have the warp drive. Maybe we have a hyper drive. Like, what can we do if we can't get that infinity drive? Also, don't assume that just because something is low cost and low value that we're gonna get it for free. It's low value, so why do we even wanna talk about it? So putting things up even visually, like imagine doing this on a wall or a virtual wall with your product owners, it really helps take the heat and the emotion out of things when you see it based on these kind of facts. Um, so we use this a lot to help manage scope. So conversation alert. Scope management is completely a team sport. The entire dev team, the entire product owner team, all the stakeholders need to participate in this. It is a conversation, it's a collaboration, and we push ourselves toward finding creative solutions. At phase two, we actually have practice conversations of scope with all of our clients. It's um, outside of the fraughtness of real project scope changes. We do it in a really abstract way so that we can practice having these conversations about trade-offs that, for things that don't really matter. And the more we do this, then we are practiced at getting away from the finger pointing or the panic and moving into a solution space. So I would highly recommend whether you are actually practicing as changes as you're developing scope or as changes occur on your project, but to have these conversations is gonna be key for you to manage things. If you're just emailing, you're not, you just don't have that human connection, which is really key uh, for scope management. So now that we know what kind of spaceship we're building and we've got the gamma rays coming from outer space and we weren't expecting them to be here. Um, so, you know, Every project, as I mentioned before with the bees, um, can, can have some uh, things called 
unknowns or changes that come on. Um, and that's life as well as software projects. Um, it's the only constant that we have in this ever shifting world. Um, so when there is a problem, which there inevitably be, will be a quote problem, um, I'm going to talk through just some strategies about how, how to work through and, and manage change. Um, so I don't know if anyone's familiar with this very famous Apollo 13 moment where they have a problem with the spaceship and they call down to Houston and everyone on the ground in Houston immediately gets to work with the folks on the spaceship to start problem solving. Now, had they seen this problem before? No, they hadn't seen the problem before, but they had worked through so many different scenarios um, about how to solve related problems and the teams had already been working together through, through drills and different scenarios so they were really really well equipped to come together and through an in very ingenious um, you know set of events bring these astronauts home um, so um, uh, that's definitely something that you know back to what Ellie mentioned earlier and related to the team sport is that everyone in the, in the project can, can be a part of um, the team to get to us to a place where we can manage um, unknown scenarios. So this quote actually comes from Donald Rumsfeld. It came out during the whole weapons of mass destruction thing, which you know I won't opinionate of whether or not that was a known known or not. However, um, I will share that um, this quote actually came up because it was used in a um, technical approach meeting that was put together by the lead developer on the bees and IT project that I worked on. His name is Ray Stewart. And he did this great presentation for the client um, about the Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 migration process. And he started with this quote and he walked through all of the different known knowns, all of the different known unknowns. And then he also started to posit what could be things that were unknown unknowns, the types of unknowns unknowns that might come up in the project. Project. And um, this was, again, my, my first big project, um, and, and I, I just felt like it was such an incredible learning experience to see the, the lead dev actually be managing uh, change in this way. And I've really taken this with me um, through, throughout um, onto a lot of my, my subsequent uh, uh, work and subsequent projects. Um, but, um, you know, the concept of the unknown unknown um, is, is, a, is a little bit sort of funky. So I kind of want to walk through um, th this example. Um, so has anyone heard of the planet Mercury, you know, closest to the sun? All right. Um, if anyone's been reading the news um, yesterday, there was this big um, moment in astronomy where Mercury was um, sort of doing this eclipse thing. It was called a transit, where Mercury was kind of marching in front of the sun. And there's this, like, you know, NASA writing news about it. So. That's totally an, like a known known. Like we know Mercury was transiting the sun. Um, but there's also sort of an unknown unknown about Mercury. And um, it's called Mercury retrograde. So Mercury retrograde is actually a term from astrology. And um, it, it refers to when the, when the planet looks like it's moving backwards in relationship to Earth. And different folks in, in, the, in the astrology world, kind of, you know, out there stuff, um, you know, b believe that, you know, the actions and the movements of the planets in the heavens might actually impact um, the daily life of people and may actually impact certain things like web servers. Um, you know, I've had a lot of experiences during Mercury ret retrograde where some servers are going down. Maybe it's Mercury retrograde, maybe it's not. We don't know. <laughs> um, but that's just one example. Um, so um, now let's talk about some strategies for um, actually managing risk and getting ahead of these unknown unknowns. So um, the worst time to actually have a conversation about how to manage risks and what solutions you're going to put in place is when you are covered in ectoplasm, on the spaceship, in your fire suits, in the middle of a huge fire. Um, the best thing to do is to talk about these things beforehand so that when you are in that there's a problem moment, you already have a basis to go from to work through solutioning. So some of the strategies um, that I'm a really big fan of are regular risk meetings. Um, I'm working on a project right now. Um, it's a Drupal 8 platform build. So we're building a Drupal 8 platform. It's going to be the basis of a platform for a major media company. And the project came in. It was very, very rapid. And there's a lot of stakeholders, even shifting goals. So uh, we decided early on, early on, like, hey, we need to have 
two risk meetings a week, and we need to talk through all the risks and the mitigation plans openly and collaboratively with the product owner. And in the first meeting, um, I remember talking to the product owner, I said, you know, I said, this is my favorite meeting. I was like, you're going to love this meeting. And initially, she was a little nervous. She's like, all right, risks sounds kind of scary. And by the end of the first meeting, she was like, I get it. This is my favorite meeting because we were talking about the risks before they even happen, what we were seeing, and then we were putting plans in place to mitigate. So, you know, the hardest thing to do is, is see something coming and feel like you can't stop the train, right? But if you are getting ahead of risks with, an, with open, transparent mitigation plans, this is a little screenshot of the, the way that, that we track risks in this project, um, you know, you're, you're able to really start to, to, to prep and get ahead. Um, Another thing is important when you're launching websites. So I don't know how many people have had a situation where you know there's been a, uh, a launch event that's happened and something crazy has happened, like a Drupal 8 site that I launched last year. Um, it got completely spidered by some unknown entity that was out on the internet that had been scraping their old site and pulling the content into some content repository. The, when we launched the site, it started to scrape the new site, but it was like out of nowhere and it caused a lot of stress on the database. So, um, um, so that, that's just one example of you know, how, how in launch protocols and rollbacks, we had actually had a whole plan for what to happen if there was an issue at launch. And so when it actually did happen, we, 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 were, we calmly had a plan and we moved into the solutioning mode. Um, so, there, are, there is another category of risks that I want to talk about, which are sort of um, a more tactical and long game risks, I like to call them. And these are risks um, where you can say it in the beginning, but either people aren't ready to hear it, they need more evidence, um, or it's just it needs to have a little bit more of a case built for, for something to move. And you know this happens a lot, especially when there are a lot of different personalities involved. Um, so in, in the case of managing a long game risk, I often sort of will work to, with the project teams, um, with the product owners to lay out the plan and work from multiple angles. And a lot of times there will be a key moment of message delivery. Maybe it'll be in a meeting or it'll be in the context of a sprint review. And in that moment, um, it's really great to think about um, who's going to be delivering the message um, for this kind of aha moment for sort of a risk solution to sort of unfold. And um, uh, the, um, so, you know, in the, in the context of this, of this aha moment, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll tee up a conversation that I know needs to happen. Um, and I use these, um, what I call the metaverse meeting tips. Um, these are some meeting tips that actually came out of um, when I worked at this big media company in Drupal 6, very political, lots of big meetings and politics. Um, and so the tips are really simple and they help you get to this long game risk management strategy. It's, does this need to be said right now? Do I need to be the one to say it? And if someone else has to say it, like how do I make that Facil facilitate that that conversation to happen, and you know a lot of times I'll I'll be, I'll be in a meeting or I'll have a meeting coming up and I'll be wor working with a tech lead or one of the requirements folks that we work with and I'll say hey, at a certain point in the meeting I'm going to turn to you and it would be really great if you could say that a thing that you said to me yesterday, and then they'll say it and then it'll start the conversation and and move us towards a solution. Um, so definitely um, you know working through um, these conversations from a strategic standpoint um, both in the mitigation plans and also in sort of the more delicate long game risk management um, are really helpful okay so once again we have the conversation alert so because you have practiced talking about risks right people are afraid of risks they think it's a bad word it is not and if we try to put our heads in the sands about it we are always going to be caught off guard when change happens and the shit hits the fan um, so if you have practiced this, like you've written down, what do we do when new droids come in? Well, we got to take them to the garage and clean them. And only then can we whine about wanting to go to Tashi Station to get some power converters. <laughs> right? That if we have not had that conversation, we're going to be standing there whining. And nobody wants that. It doesn't help us move forward at all. OK, so now we've talked about scope and change, and now we're going to talk about Drupal 8 and how that may change a little bit or influence or impact how we manage scope and change. 
Great. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been around Drupal for a while and I've sort of seen the system evolve and it was really great to be in Dries' keynote today and see all of these things, especially the admin experience be like, you know, 46% or 72% of the focus. Um, so there's, there's a lot of great stuff that's happening in Drupal 8. Um, and it's, you know, I've been working with it. This is, I guess, coming into the second year of working with Drupal 8. So there's definitely um, a lot of um, new things there and sort of new uh, wrinkles that have come come into play when, when managing the projects that um, I just want to kind of talk through. Um, so just to sort of um, give, give you guys like a high level summary, I mean, I know people are pretty pretty aware of a lot of this stuff, but um, I'll just talk through some of um, the, the highlights and things that I, I particularly have kind of gravitated on and of what's in Drupal 8. So there's been sort of a major, major rethink um, of the Drupal 8 um, admin experience in the UX, which is definitely huge when we talk about what we're getting out of the box, right? We There, there is definitely a lot of improvements there. Um, and, you know, we also have tools like Views, which I don't know if people know Views. Um, it's a module, used to be in Drupal. Um, contrib space, but it was sort of like a requirement basically for building con building complex content lists and pretty much doing any kind of querying. Um, so now that that's in core, um, we also have a complete rethinking of the multilingual. Um, and then in addition, um, we have the configuration management, um, which is really a, a layer that's been built on, on underlaying Drupal that allows you to move the database configurations, which are all those checkbox and all those settings easily between environments so that your site can be more stable. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, there's a brand new front end templating system um, which has been introduced um, in Drupal 8. It's based on Twig um, and it sits in with a lot of the other PHP best practice libraries that have, bought it, that have been brought into to Drupal 8. Um, but, you know, it's important to also note that back into kind of what we're getting in the box, that we still have things in Drupal that are sort of Drupalisms um, that are uh, part of the framework of the system that we're, we're within. Um, one of the, the best examples is the, the pager count. So um, back in Drupal 5, I was when I was queuing sites, I saw, well, it says I'm on page 2, but the URL says page 1, which seemed extremely broken. Um, and, you know, I logged a bug. Index starts at zero. Well, I mean, that's not how people count. <laughs> Unless you're a computer programmer <laughs> um, or a computer. Um, so, you know, that <laughs> that is still, um, that's still in, in, in Drupal. And, you know, it's, it's definitely still something that, um, you know, wor work is designed or won't fix. So um, there, there still are things like that that do come up. And I think it's important to, again, understand the constraints of what, what the box is and how the system is. And if you're going to be trying to change something like that, just understanding the, the cost that it might take to, to sort of flip something. We really need this thing to be moved down, you know? It's like, no, you don't really need that. Or maybe you do, and like, if you need that, then, then we can prioritize it. Um, so uh, I want to talk through the modules. So um, everyone knows um, in Drupal, or if you don't know, um, modules are sort of like those extra Legos that you can add on to make the, the ship even more full featured. Um, and in Drupal 7 and before, um, there was tons and tons of mod modules in the contrib space that you could add onto your site. And to basically get a site that was relatively like functional usually you needed a fair amount of modules like you know at least like 30 modules um, you know you needed modules to do content lists you needed modules to do layout management you needed modules to do even vanity URLs you need a module for a WYSIWYG you needed modules like features to do your configuration management so you could um, you know move your configuration through different environments so there's a really um, you know deep amount of contrib modules that were in Drupal 7 um, in Drupal 8 a lot of these have actually been pulled into Drupal core and you can actually get started and building a site and the modules modules that are in Drupal 8, you know, are, there obviously are modules and there's a, a healthy contrib space as well, but they're sort of even more specialized and even more kind of, um, you know, flashy features or special kinds of caching or workflow. Um, 
And, you know, just as an example, um, the Memorial Sun Kettering site um, that presented on last year, DrupalCon, I think their previous site in Drupal 6 had like over 150 modules. The Drupal 8 site, I think, launched with under 20. I think it was nine contrib modules. So, I mean, that's the amount of, of difference. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of where some of that other code goes, which is, you know, potentially in custom modules and some extensions. But, um, you know, I've also seen a lot of kind of RFPs where people have talking about their Drupal 6 site and they say, here's all of our modules. Are you upgrading all of them? And the answer really is, no, no, we're not going to just start upgrading all of your Drupal 6 modules one by one to Drupal 8. Is we're going to look holistically at what you need to accomplish and really understand how we can do that in Drupal 8 and then back into what modules we need. Um, so that's the modules conversation. Um, and then sort of um, kind of to, to roll all the module conversation together, I want to kind of come back to the, to the global. Because the global aspect of Drupal 8 um, is a really great example of how the, the modules have been condensed and brought into core. So um, when I worked at the, the media platform in Drupal 6, we had a big global site. Uh, platform, right? You know, sites in 20, 30 languages. There was about like 20 modules needed just to get the thing translated, localized, URL routed, country codes, translation imported. Everything was on like six different screens of checkboxes, and you had to go to like four places to just turn Swedish on your site. And you know, now um, now with Drupal 8, I mean, th that whole process has been completely, um, you know, re-architected and integrated into core. So um, on the Drupal platform that I'm working on now, we needed to spin the site up in, in another language um, just to, to show something, to see how it would look on right, reading right to left. And we did it in like under an hour. And I was just like, shocked because before there was a lot of time spent pulling the patch from this module. Oh, we need to patch this module. This patch is con in conflict with this thing just to get something like that to work. So, um, you know, this example is sort of on a small scale of kind of what we're seeing overall now with um, the, the sort of weight of module interactions and patch management um, that is a little bit different from previous versions of Drupal to the current Drupal. Um, and then um, I want to talk a little bit about front-end magic, um, which I alluded to a little bit before. But this is really exciting um, and definitely will be um, impacting a lot of people's projects. Um, the templating engine that's in Drupal 8 um, is called Twig. It's a, P it's a modern PHP templating engine. Um, you don't actually need to know, like, Drupalized PHP, which you did need to know to theme a Drupal 6 and a Drupal 7 site. I remember when I worked at this media company that the skills needed for a good Drupal themer was like so specific. It was like, you know, a list of like JavaScript, amazing at JavaScript, CSS, HTML, plus PHP, plus you've done Drupal config. And now um, there's so much exploding in the front end world. There's all these different JavaScript frameworks, React.js, AngularJS. We've got a lot of people talking about headless Drupal. And we really do have an opportunity to integrate a lot of the best practices and a lot of the cool stuff that's happening in front-end development without necessarily having people to like fit it into Drupal and the markup can be cleaner which was always a big sort of you know uh, fiery point of all the, the, the Drupal themer purists who love front-end development but like also really want to make beautiful markup. Um, so that's definitely um, something that I think um, you guys are going to be uh, probably, you know, interacting with a lot and the opportunities for, like, bringing in people that haven't even worked with Drupal. On the Drupal 8 project that I worked on, um, we actually had the front end that was um, designed and built um, built by a design agency. And the front end developer, she had never done any Drupal before. We were able to integrate it, and we got about 80% code reuse. Um, wasn't completely headless, but um, it, was, it really did work, um, which was um, pretty pretty incredible. Um. So um, the last thing I want to talk through here um, is uh, this concept I call stack inception. So mentioned that we've pulled a lot more stuff into, into core, right? Um, there's a whole lot of different layers. We've got Symphony, the PHP layer. We've got Composer, dependency management. We've got Twig. We've got this thing called Big Pipe. I kind of know what it is. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that's, that's under the hood now. And what that means is that there's a higher level of complexity when it comes to debugging and edge cases. And um, especially when um, you're working with a lot of different layers and you're trying to extend things um, within, within Drupal core. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the 
what the stack inception, um, what it means from the object-oriented programming perspective. Okay, so I want to talk about object orientation because it's going to be important for you guys, even as PMs, to know some of the basics of it. It will have an impact on how you're going to manage your project in several ways. Okay, so an, an object is an entity um, that could be a physical thing or an idea or a part of code. So it actually can be all of those things, which makes abstraction or thinking about goals to features to actual code a little simpler. Um, it has state and behaviors. So it has something and it can do things. Um, and there's these four elements that object orientation makes possible. So abstraction, that allows us to think about things not in their messiness, but as clean things, right? So when we talk about goal feature code. Encapsulation allows me to hide my mess from you. So I have an inter my object has an interface. It will give you a piece of data. You send me the command. It could be a pain for me to gather what you need, but you don't need to be bothered by that. It's pretty sweet. So that's one of the key benefits of object orientation. Modularity, so an example of um, object orientation in life is um, the the universal remotes. So I have a remote that will work on my Sony and my Philips and my LED or LCD. What's the? I can't remember the name. Whatever, another TV. LED? L, uh, I don't know, whatever. LG, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so it'll work on all of those because we've got these interfaces that we can talk about. And sometimes we call them APIs. Um, and so Modularity is the idea that at one point we might have had like a settings interface that then it basically dumps me into your mess on your Sony and it dumps you into the LG mess, right? And then you've got all these menus and I've got to click all this stuff. There's some benefit in that, but there's also benefit in having like an input interface where I can then choose what my input is going to be much more easily. So that's an example of modularity. And then hierarchy, you guys know what that means. There's no hidden meaning here. It basically allows that we can inherit from objects. So this is rudimentary UML um, to kind of explain some of the concepts of object orientation. So our parent class here is a vehicle. We're not even showing some of its states, but we've got some behaviors like we can count tires, we can uh, return an engine type, and we can go. Um, so these are the vehicles that uh, inherit from vehicle, and you can see how they're going to have some different things, right? So airplane's going to need to uh, extend vehicle because it's got to have something to do with wings. Um, you could argue, and boat similarly, like the tires are less important, but it's got to have some flotation stuff. So they're going to take vehicle and make it different. A spaceship might be so radical that you might say maybe it shouldn't even inherit from vehicle. And you could also maybe say maybe spaceship and airplane have a relationship. Right? So see how I'm talking. I'm talking about things in the abstract and how they could relate to each other and how we can build on them. And that's kind of how you start thinking when you think about objects. So then we've got car, which breaks down. And note that we have some namespace stuff going on with Tesla and Mercedes S. And that's a key part of uh, the namespacing within PHP and Drupal. Um, note that Tesla has two parents. Like it inherits from car, but it also inherits from Elon Musk. Um, he, above him, has a really long hierarchy of entrepreneurs and great thinkers. So he's not like born uh, like that. He has to inherit them. Um, and, but he's got a new method he's going to pass in, which is share it. And so if you are building a car from Tesla, you're going to have share it. And you're going to be able to, through that, do things that you couldn't do with MDX without getting sued by Acura. So does that make sense? So when you start to think about things, you can see the power that comes from using objects. OK, so the key bit for Drupal is that you don't need to hack core. So I saw a guy with the I hack core t-shirt, and I wanted to take a picture and say, sweetie, you don't really need to do that anymore. Because what you can do is extend core. 
So you can take all the glory that it is, but you need to do something different. You don't have to patch it. You can just take it and modify it and have it be your own thing. So we could say that Mark Watney modifying the Mav in The Martian was either a total hack or the most desperate and beautiful extension ever. But that's the basics that's going to be key as you're managing projects. OK, so the final thing about object orientation is that, well, this is really about software development in general. So inevitably, your product owner is going to say, is that possible? Like, I've got some great idea. Is that possible? Okay. Think about it may be possible, but just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it, right? So shooting Bruce Willis and a ragtag team of miners up to destroy an asteroid might have seemed like a good idea, but was it really necessary? So again, when we think about the goals and the features and the implementation, keep that line, right? To every time, is that possible? Sure, I used to say, we can do everything except make Cindy Crawford come out of your monitor. But do you really want all that? Sometimes people would want Cindy Crawford to come out of the monitor, but thankfully that wasn't possible. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little bit of um, role playing on our holodeck. Um, these are our holodeck hats. So when we're in character, we'll be wearing these hats. Um, I am gonna be the project manager, um, and Ellie is going to be our developer. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation about um, our Drupal 8 project that we're, we're working on. Um, hey, Ellie, thanks for agreeing to meet such last minute. I know you've been working hard on the sprint. Um, so I just had a review meeting with uh, Product Tina, the product owner, and um, she was asking for um, a, a tweak to the comments page. Apparently, it's really critical that we move the comment box from below the comment listing to above the comment listing, since it mirrors the current system that we're rebuilding, and it would be a big win for stakeholders for them to feel like the system is going to be somewhat like the old system. I told her that it didn't seem like such a big deal, and we could probably fit it in, but I wanted to check in with you and just see your thoughts of, you know, how we could strategize to get that in. Yeah, well, actually, like, feature B that we've been working on, um, we thought it was going to take this sprint and next sprint, but I think we're going to actually finish at this sprint. So write it up, and we can take a look at it. If it's important to them, let's pull it into next sprint. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Okay, um, it's a week later, um, and we're at um, our, our sprint stand-up, um, so. Uh, hey, Ellie, um, I wanted to know if you could give your update. What have you been working on in the last 24? Do you have any blockers? Uh, what's, what's happening? Oh, my God. Yeah, boy, do I have blockers. Okay, so that comment boxing, oh, my God. I don't even know where to start. Okay, so I've kind of figured it out. but So it started as a JavaScript error. And so I've been trying to just debug where it's coming from. I, I'm not really sure. I'm just going into modules like I never thought I would. But I mean, thankfully, I'm kind of able to, to do some debugging. But I just have no idea. I don't know. It could take me an hour. It could take me a few days. I just have no idea. But it can be done by Friday, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. It could take me a few hours or a few days. Uh, okay, I just thought when you said a few days, I just thought maybe Friday would be would be done. But um, has anyone else like seen anything in Drupal eight? Have you have you saw saw this issue before? No, this is totally new. I mean, I th I think we kind of talked about it as unknown unknowns with using Drupal eight. Like this seems really edge casey, but it's a total pain. I'm really having to debug the hell out of it. Okay, well, um, that's really good to know. Thanks for the update. Um, I think I'm probably going to have to give Productina a call and just give her the update and start to manage expectations around this. Um, all right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to take off our hats for a minute. Um, we're going to get a little meta here. Um, so what should I do? <laughs> um, I'm the project manager. So I have a few options. I'm going to walk, walk through them, and then we'll do a little voting. Um, so my first option is I can, uh, I can push back on Ellie to get it done, no matter how long it takes. Be like, look, I need you to work all night. We have to get this done. You said you can debug it in a few days, but what, but what if you spend 24 hours? Could, could you get it done faster? So that's option one. 
Option two is I could just kind of like quietly, like every hour, like send her an IM and just be like, hey, how's the comments going? And then maybe at the end of each day, send her an email. Um, just, just to, you know, to make sure it's, it's moving forward. Um, I could, um, I could, I can call a product Tina, the product owner, and tell her that we need one more week. The task was a little more complicated, but that it was going to be definitely be done by next Friday. Um, or I could raise this in our risk meeting and work with the product owner to find the right solution on mitigating. Um, so if everyone can just clap for their one and we'll, we'll go through the numbers. So for number one, who thinks we should do number one? All right. Number two? Number three? Number four? All right. So now you know Kung Fu. <laughs> so I wanted to lecture a little bit about why we don't do these things. So uh, number one is it's like Molly is acting out of fear and total ignorance. Like without checking with the product owner, she doesn't really know whether it's so important that she's going to put in her chit for can you work overnight. And so she'd be just wasting. Um, number two is not only the same but totally passive aggressive, which has no place in a product team. Number three is just do, it's almost the same as number one. It's working from ignorance and panic, she's going to set an arbitrary date that we may not be able to fill. So that kind of narrows us down to having number four as the sometimes hardest but most efficient and effective method. So we're going to go back into the holodeck. Um, and this time Ellie is going to be product Tina. So I'm the product owner. <laughs> Hey, Productina, how's it going? Great, I'm totally excited to hear how things are going. Oh, awesome. Well, the team has been doing really well. Sprint 2, um, we're really going through the points. Things are coming together. It's exciting to see the system that we've been talking about for the last month and a half actually coming to fruition. So I'm, I'm super excited. I think you're going to be excited when we do the Sprint review meeting next week. Um, but I did actually want to talk to you about um, a risk that's come up um, and get together a plan to how to mitigate it. So do you remember the um, feature? that you called me about last week, the moving those comments to the top of the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, we've actually come across um, some pretty deep JavaScript bugs and errors that are sort of deep in the system, um, actually related to some, uh, some Drupal 8 edge cases that we've come across. So um, the sort of risk issue is that we don't know if it's going to be done by this Friday wait, wait, as wait, originally wait. planned. Yeah. My boss is coming to town on Friday. She totally wants to see that. I know that you don't think it's really important, but for her, it's super, super critical. Oh my God, you guys have to get it done. Yeah, I totally you hear. Can't do this to me, Molly. All right, Product Tina, I totally hear you, and I was actually thinking about this because I know how important it is for her to see the site and this feature that's a little reminiscent of the old platform. So she has confidence, and she can share that confidence with the stakeholders. So I was thinking about this, and here's the plan that I put together. Let me know what you think. So what if we pulled together um, a small deck that sort of recapped a lot of the features we've been building in this sprint, um, some of the ones that we have actually replicated from the old. Site system. And then we could even put together a couple of slides about the process for the comment box and where we're at and actually circling back to that unknown unknowns that we walked through in the product kickoff. And kind of, I can actually also invite Ellie to come to the meeting and maybe walk through those specific slides just so she has some confidence and we can be really transparent about it. Um, so I wanted to see if that would be something you'd want to collaborate on so that we can work on this together. Okay. Um... Well, first, I think I need to apologize. Like, I, I know we've, we've talked about the unknowns, unknowns for a long time. I don't really think I understood what they were until this moment. Um, so I'm sorry. I <laughs> totally acted out of a place of emotion. I'm really glad that you moved us into solution space. Um, I think that would work. Like, I remember when we talked about unknowns, unknowns with my boss, she was kind of into it. Like, she thinks that we're, like, in the new frontier with Drupal 8. So I think that sounds good. As long as we can keep showing her that we're making progress on the other fronts, she actually might be kind of psyched that we've uncovered something that's totally new. OK, great. So um, I'll work on pulling together the deck, and then maybe we can set up a review meeting like um, Wednesday before your big meeting. OK, that sounds okay great. All right, thanks. <laughs> OK, so. 
Um, I think that the take home is that uh, conversation is key. So whenever I'm at a party and I tell people that I work in tech, sometimes I'll get a response like, oh my god, it must be so great. You're working with computers all the time. You don't have to deal with people. <laughs> right? And I think, oh my gosh, it, it's all the humans. Like, it is so much easier to just code it up than to deal with the humans and all the baggage that we have. And so one of the keys for us in managing scope and managing change, and even with dealing with the newness, excitement, and inevitable quirks of Drupal 8 is to have conversations about it. So I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that um, was it. Yeah. So we're at um, booth 101 if you want to come join us and, and continue the conversation, or I guess you can come up here and we're, we're happy to talk with you in the next couple of minutes. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, and just one last note, um, just a little fun fact. The example that we gave about the comments, um, it actually was a real issue that um, some of our software architects encountered in a Drupal 8 project. So um, there'll be more to come on that one. Um, but yeah, come by and see us, booth 101. And thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks.